In 1983, 9-9 Records released Optimo, the third EP by New York band Liquid Liquid. One track off of Optimo, Cavern, quickly spread around the New York dance scene. Even if you've never heard Cavern, you would probably recognize its relaxed groove and looping bass line. That's because in October of 83, Sugar Hill Records released Melly Mel's White Lines, which was based around a recreation of Cavern's rhythm section. White Lines was a massive hit, and 9-9 rightly felt entitled to a cut of the royalties. A legal battle ensued, and 9-9 was awarded $600,000 in the settlement. $600,000 that Sugar Hill was unable to pay. Sugar Hill declared bankruptcy, and now unable to pay the legal fees, 9-9 called it quits. In 1986, after a series of financial and legal misadventures, Sugar Hill followed suit. One song ended two labels. And not only that, they were massively influential labels. Sugar Hill was the first label to find commercial success in hip-hop. 9-9 was an emerging tastemaker with the New York avant-garde, and its artists inspired later bands such as Sonic Youth and LCD Sound System. There are a few moments in music history that could mark the end of the 1970s most notably 1979's Disco Demolition Night. But the White Lines lawsuit feels a little bit different. It feels like the end of the end of the 70s. The frontier had been cleared and the pioneers died off. Goodbye 70s, hello 80s. But when tracing the threads that lead to this moment, an interesting narrative emerges, one in which New York becomes a petri dish for emerging and competing musical styles, one in which all roads lead to disco. At the tail end of the 1960s, a new sound came out of Philadelphia. Combining the best traits of Motown and JB's style funk, Philly Soul was perfect for the dance floor. The style was best exemplified by the artists on Philadelphia International Records and the talented musicians within its house band. Philly International drummer Earl Young made a key contribution with his four to the floor kick patterns. In a classic backbeat, kicks are on one and three with snares on two and four. Motown flipped the script with snares on all four beats and kicks on the upbeats. Earl Young flipped it once again, this time with kicks on all four beats, creating a bottom-heavy sound that you could literally feel in the dance floor. This style was quickly embraced by the Loft's David Mancuso and the New York City club community. Under the guidance of its DJs and dancers, the style quickly developed into disco. Meanwhile, bands in New York and Detroit were inspired by grimy garage rock, high-energy surf rock, and the British Invasion. These bands like the MC5, the Stooges, and the Velvet Underground made chaotic, visceral rock music, which we now recognize as proto-punk. This style proved to be influential, and when combined with early 70s glam rock, inspired the first wave of New York punk. These artists took the distorted, jagged sound of the Velvet Underground's white light, white heat, and they condensed it into a sort of musical amphetamine. But while punk thrived in New York's underground dives, disco dominated the clubs. DJs began pushing the boundaries of what it means to play records. DJs like Nicky Ciano, Francois Kevorkian, and Tom Moulton started experimenting with new techniques, such as looped breaks and synced crossfades. They also created the first remixes, recutting tracks into sprawling dance floor odysseys. When MCs in the Bronx began rapping over disco breaks, it was a continuation of this impulse to modify and interact with records, to make pre-recorded music live again. But as disco was breaking new conceptual ground, punk splintered into factions. Post-punk wasn't as much a unified genre as much as a series of reactions and reconfigurations. Punk was merged with minimalism, electronic music, funk, and of course, disco. Variety was always a part of the punk scene, but the post-punk era took the syncretism to new heights. The most commercially successful fusion was New Wave, a friendlier, more approachable punk, Experimental musicians rejected New Wave, seeing it as a defanged version of punk. This rejection coalesced into the No Wave scene, in which artists like James Chance, Lydia Lunch, and Swans took the biting, aggressive edge of punk into new territory. Independent labels like ZE and Roar sprung up to spread the gospel of the cutting edge. One such label was Nine Nine Records, which Ed Ballman built out of a record shop that he ran out of a clothing shop. Ballman created the label at the request of Glenn Branca, guitarist and composer. Branca's guitar ensembles would be a breeding ground for no waivers, with bands like Swans and Sonic Youth forming from its alumni. Meanwhile, up north in Englewood, New Jersey, another label was founded by singer, songwriter, and industry veteran Sylvia Robinson. 
Robinson had been deep in the music industry since the 1950s when she scored her first major hit with Mickey and Sylvia's Love is Strange. Instead of the downtown punk favored by Nine Nine, Robinson's Sugar Hill Records was more interested in the hip-hop sound coming out of the Bronx. With artists like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and the Funky Four Plus One, Sugar Hill Records was ready to storm the mainstream. And it did. Fast. Their first single, Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight, was the first hip-hop track to ever reach the top 40, peaking at 36 in the States but reaching the top 5 in the UK, Canada, and the Netherlands. Rapper's Delight was built around a loop from Sheik's Good Times, as re-recorded by the Sugar Hill House Band. So now is a good time to talk about sampling and the historical moment where this all takes place. At this point, sampling, or even Sugar Hill's variety of interpolation, hadn't really become an established practice. So while Sugar Hill was reckless with attribution, they were also doing something fairly unprecedented. Did they know it was unethical and possibly illegal? Existing evidence seems to point to yes. But before passing any kind of judgment, it's worth considering how often unauthorized sampling happens today with 40 years of hindsight. According to Sugar Hill House Band member Keith LeBlanc, Robinson hired an arranger to scout out popular MCs, raps, and disco breaks. He would then transcribe the breaks and write out charts for the band. One of the songs that he transcribed just happened to be a 9-9 record, Liquid Liquid's Cavern. Liquid Liquid, along with fellow 9-9 artist ESG, represented the more dance-oriented, disco-influenced side of post-punk. Liquid Liquid's music was percussion-driven, with vocals used more for their rhythmic quality than for their melodic or even semantic qualities. With Optimo, Liquid Liquid reached a peak, with Side A featuring two of their finest tracks, the title track Optimo and Cavern. Though White Lines was Cavern at its core, Sugar Hill made some modifications. The nearly indecipherable lyrics of the original were replaced with a cautionary tale about drug use, and likely inspired by Euro Disco and Techno, Synth parts were added via a Sequential Circuit's Prophet 5, but it was still unmistakably cavern, so though the lawsuit ran on for over a year, it was clear that it would end in 9-9's favor. Despite threats from Sugar Hill, 9-9 held on long enough to win a $600,000 settlement. Unfortunately, Sugar Hill couldn't pay the settlement and declared bankruptcy. 9-9 folded due to the legal costs and Sugar Hill was on life support, but luckily Sylvia Robinson had an ace up her sleeve. In the mid-70s, her all-platinum records label had purchased the catalog of Chess Records, the massively influential blues label. Putting the highly coveted Chess Records catalog up as collateral, Sugar Hill signed a deal with MCA. But Sugar Hill's output couldn't compete with the new generation of hip-hop on labels like Def Jam Recordings and Tommy Boy. In a last-ditch effort to hold onto its masters, Sugar Hill sued MCA. In the settlement, Sugar Hill kept its masters, but MCA walked away with the Chess catalog. In 1986, Sugar Hill Records finally closed its doors. The White Lines lawsuit stands at a crossroads in music history, where the underground and the mainstream collided with disastrous results, where hip-hop and punk were united and divided by disco. To bring us full circle, Ballman mentored a young producer named Rick Rubin just before the lawsuit. Rubin sought guidance while creating his own independent label. That label? Def Jam Recordings. If you like this video, like, subscribe, hit the bell, and so on. For more information on this pivotal era in music history, I recommend the following books. Tim Lawrence's Love Saves a Day is a definitive book on 70s New York disco. His sequel, Life and Death on the New York Dance Floor, follows disco's many offspring. For extra credit, I recommend Michelangelo Matos's The Underground is Massive. It's a sprawling look at how dance music took over the world. For the definitive history of punk, there's no better book than Please Kill Me by Gillian McCain and Legs McNeil. It's a first-person look at punk's formative years by the people who lived it. If you like that book, I recommend Chasing It with Our Band Could Be Your Life by Michael Azerod. This profiles 80s and 90s independent rock groups. For a modern update of Please Kill Me, I recommend Lizzie Goodman's Meet Me in the Bathroom, which covers 2000s New York rock. For the early history of hip-hop, Jeff Chang's Can't Stop, Won't Stop is pretty much unrivaled. I also recommend Shea Serrano's The Rap Yearbook, which takes a more personal approach. 
He takes one song per year since Rapper's Delight and contextualizes it within the greater hip-hop landscape. For advanced studies, I recommend Dan Charnas's The Big Payback, which takes an interesting approach. He looks at the history of hip-hop through business deals and industry moves. It's an underexplored approach that I think produces a fascinating read. Anyway, on that beat, thanks for watching.